Our topic today is related to ministering to your spouse and kind of keeping your vows. I have two men who I regard as heroes of the faith sitting up talking uh, with us today, uh, Greg Hatterberg and Hall Harris. And you received on your way in a brochure. Well, the reason we're doing this topic is in part because we've got uh, the, the center's uh, conference in the spring, Ministry of the Marginalized, Overcoming Obstacles, in which we're going to be discussing how the church can minister to people who normally operate on the edges and are marginalized in society in one way or another, either because of uh, mental conditions that they have or physical limitations or terminal illness that they may be facing, all kinds of uh, a variety of conditions, etc., and the church struggles to know how to incorporate them into the, their community and really help people to function uh, with them in community. And so uh, the conference on April 20th uh, from 9 a.m. to 3.30 is here at the seminary. Kay Warren is going to be coming to speak to us uh, about her experience with her son who of course uh, suffered from depression and committed suicide and talking about how to minister in that kind of a context. Uh, we also have uh, coming around on the horizon of course as everyone knows the Agape Project that's going to talk about equipping us to minister in, in these kinds of ways and in these kinds of contexts. So it's an important aspect of what we're doing. We think it uh, is a reflection of of Jesus' commitment to ministry to the, to the marginalized and what we see in his own ministry. So for that reason, it's an important topic. And the reason I've asked these two distinguished gentlemen to join us is because they have cared for their spouses in really uh, significant ways over a long period of time. And I want them to talk about uh, their experience and the, and the commitment that that involves and, and to help us a little bit negotiate our way through this area. They both have important uh, personal stories. I'm going to start with Hall, because Hall, um, you've been married to Ursula for how long? Uh, 31 years. 31 years. And um, what most people don't know is that when you married Ursula, you had some idea about where you were headed because of the conditions that she had when you got married. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, yeah, there's several things actually that are going on. Um, Ursula has uh, visual issues, uh, side issues. Uh, she has a condition known as retinitis pigmentosa, which is sometimes called tunnel vision. Uh, there's no night vision. Uh, your visual field is restricted, uh, but hers was from early childhood, if not congenital. That's not the typical pattern. The typical pattern is you develop this when you're 30 something and within five years you go from normal vision to blind. Hmm. Uh, hers was stable over 45, 55 years uh, until things went over the cliff when she got her kidney transplant. So, and I have to add too, by the way, genetically they've identified over 250 different types of RP. Mm. So, and the type she has, she's been genetically tested. They haven't ever given us any information back. They apparently don't know exactly what it is. So that means the profile is not predictable. <laughs> the second thing is that right at the time we got married, we found out she also had some kidney deficiency and she was given some instructions about diet and other things that would help, but it had to be monitored. And it was monitored for a long time, and uh, her kidney condition was slowly, her function was slowly declining. And about eight years ago, she had to start on dialysis. Um, it got below the threshold, uh, which is about 18 to 20% remaining function combined both kidneys. Mm. Um, and that's when you start having effects and it starts affecting your, your life. Um, and she was on, she got put on a waiting list for a kidney transplant at that point. Um, obviously, uh, live donor is preferable, but we didn't have any eligible. I'm not eligible for one thing. I, 
I'm not eligible to donate any tissue because I lived in the UK for over six months back in the early 80s. So you're exposed to mad cow disease and exactly that disqualified right. you. <laughs> and it has an unknown incubation period, but it's in excess of 30 years. Hmm. And so I can't give blood. Hmm. I can't give bone marrow. I can't do anything. They won't even talk to me. Mm-hmm. Even though like I said, <laughs> you know. You are a mad cow. You know, I, I think Ursula would have been willing to take the risk because she'd lived in the UK for a year her Herself, That's right. You know, and, and so we're probably equally exposed, but it's part of the system. You can't mm-hmm. do it. So anyway, she got put on a list for a deceased donor, and in Texas at the time, the wait time was between three to seven years. I think it's crept up to around five right now as average. And so four years after that, that is in January 26th of 2011, we got the phone call. Uh, during the middle of the day, <clears throat> it was the fifth t- phone call. I was about to ask you what time you got that call. The other four <laughs> turned out not to work. They were not matches. So you go in and you have to be tested. They try to do all the matching tissue typing blood work within, I think, about six hours because this kidney's got obviously a limited viability. And so we went in on January 26th. It was a Wednesday and uh, things matched. And so that night at 10 p.m., she was taken into surgery, and uh, they finished up about four hours later, and things looked really good. Uh, Thursday, the 27th, uh, by Friday, the 28th, they were even talking about letting her go home uh, by Sunday. Uh, And things looked really good, and we scrambled around getting everything lined up, and then Saturday night, things started to deteriorate. And so she started developing fever and aches and pains and uh, abdominal cramps. And so the initial thought was that the medi- one of the three uh, immunosuppressant medications that she was on to turn her immune system off so it wouldn't reject the kidney was reacting. Some people develop allergic reactions to some of this stuff. And so they decided to stop that and see if it would, the, the kidney function started to fail. And so they did, and to make a long story a little bit shorter, by, by Saturday night, um, I, well, it was actually, I think it was Saturday night, I went home uh, and, you know, came back the next morning early, and she'd had a fall. Hmm. She was sitting in a chair and tried to get up, unassisted, fell and hit her head. So now they're all worried about hematomas and everything else, and they do CT scans, and they decide that's not so bad, but she develops abdominal swelling, high fever. uh, And so Monday, February 1st, uh, I go in at 4 a.m., and I'm planning on staying with her in the hospital room because the weather is deteriorating. We have an ice storm coming in. This is 2011. This was the week the seminary was closed for an entire week. I think it's the only time in the seminary's history it was ever closed for one straight week of classes we came due to close weather. This year. We did come close, <laughs> but this was, you know, this was five days in a row. And so I was planning on staying with her. Well, later that day they do another two CT scans, find an air pocket in her abdomen, decide that either this is something that messed up with the surgery or she's developed peritonitis. She goes into emergency surgery and, you know, four hours later I talk to the doctor and it's like night and day. We've now got a major catastrophe on her hands. She had advanced peritonitis, which explained why the kidney was failing. They had to resection her colon. They couldn't do all the repairs in one surgery, so they have to basically keep her sedated for four more days in ICU which means I can't stay in the ICU. I could have stayed in a regular room, so I end up crashing with one of my students over here in Washington because I couldn't get home. It was like iced over and everything was shut down. And it just went from bad to worse after that. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, she was um, in ICU for about 10 days. Uh, It took a long time after they turned off the uh, sedation for her to wake up. Mm -hmm. I was told at one point, we don't know if she's going to wake up. Mm -hmm. Um, and this was, you know, and I'm working with a medical team of probably three transplant surgeons and assorted interns, internal medicine people, infectious disease people, and they're doing rounds all the time. And I'm talking to them almost constantly. And 
you know, after that, uh, she did start to wake up uh, about four or five days later, um, but she's incoherent. Hmm. She's delirious. She's not there. And so, I mean, this went on for about 10 more days. And it, one thing led to another. She went home uh, 73 days after going in the hospital. This was April 3rd, I think it was. Was home for uh, a week, went back to the emergency room over the weekend with a fever. In for three days, went back home two weeks later, that is end of April, went back in because she developed bleeding in her colon and they determined that this is topical from the wounds, it's not internal. The next morning she's got a fever of 101 something and the kidney's gone into rejection. And so that was six more weeks in the hospital. And she actually went through a cytomegalovirus, was treated for that, then went through a rejection episode that they had to give her thymoglobulin for totally shut off her immune system. The long and short of it was she was about four months in the hospital hmm. the first year. And she's had numerous surgeries and complications since. I'll give one example. Um, her eyesight went over the edge of the cliff. She's now like totally blind. Uh, she can see a little bit uh, in the very center on a screen if it's reversed image, but it's getting to the point where it's really difficult to cope even with taking care of yourself at home. Mm -hmm. She can't really, I, I can't really be away overnight. I don't mm -hmm. travel anymore mm -hmm. because you know, our son or our daughter have to leave their job and come and stay with her one night for me to go to faculty workshop in August mm -hmm. uh, at, in Tyler. Um, but she went in at the end of, uh, it was a year and a half ago, to get some CT scans and MRIs of her head, see if they could see any problem in the optic nerve they discover not one, but four aneurysms in her brain. Hmm. One of which is threshold size for being dangerous. Hmm. So we went through, I don't know how many neurologists, neurosurgeons, interventional radiologists, we were looking at, you know, doing a procedure to try to address that. And two days before the procedure, she's back in the hospital. You know, and long story short, she's now being monitored for that. Mm. I mean, every, we now have gone to one year on a, you know, monitoring cycle. It was every six months. Mm. Yeah. That's just one example. Yeah, well. Yeah. So, it, so that's where we are. And you've been, so this ongoing care has really gone on almost from the beginning of your marriage and certainly has intensified in the last, what, five, six years? Well, I wouldn't say it's been ongoing for that long. It's really, in, it's really become acute, though, in the past, uh, well, with the dialysis, but now even more after the transplant. The last four years have really been uh, time-consuming, let's mm -hmm. just put it that way. Yeah. Now, Greg, Lisa, ta ta tell us your story. Well, first of all, let me tell you why I love and appreciate this guy. Yeah. Notice how much detail mm -hmm. and care and attention to Ursula that he has. Mm -hmm. I mean, most guys bolt mm -hmm. and don't know anything. And that's why that's mm -hmm. why I love and appreciate Hall so much. And so many others. I mean, I feel honored that we're that we're up here, but you got Bill and you with yeah. Sally. We, I mean, we got Jim with, with Lori, and we, I mean, there's all yeah. kinds of faculty here that have mm -hmm. gone through Wrong. this kind of these kind of situations. Um, with Lisa and I, uh, we were we've been married. Uh, we've been married 35 years. Um, when we were f uh, we were up in Illinois, and uh, I was just going to you know be farming, mm -hmm. and then we came down to <laughs> seminary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So you're sowing different kind of seeds. That's right. That's right. <laughs> or it changed my field. But we're still working on the that's seed and the word. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, but the first semester we were down here in seminary, we'd been married four years, and first semester in seminary, uh, she started to develop a double vision. She was an executive secretary at the bank, the big green bank downtown. Hmm. You know, I don't know what the name of it is, but it changes names. But it's always the green, green. bank. It's the green one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and... Um, and she had double vision, and we thought it was maybe just fatigue, and, and eventually we found out that it was uh, multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. But back in 84, um, 
it was the MRIs weren't really uh, significant mm -hmm. enough to. They said we don't want it to go on your insurance, so we're not going to determine that. And uh, so we we uh, she had the flare ups and everything, and it eventually started affecting her feeling. And and um, we went through. Uh, uh, then in '86, uh, she got pregnant, mm -hmm. and I mean I was there, but but uh, the uh, uh, it's actually encouraging to yeah, hear. Exactly. <laughs> and, the, and the symptoms went away for five years. I mean, huh. we, we had all four kids huh. within five years, hmm. um, and uh, she didn't have. She was only sick two days in five years. I mean, of morning sickness, hmm. and uh, uh, all the symptoms went away. And so we thought, there's the cure, you know. And uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, but then in '92, after David was born, six months after David was born, uh, the MS came back with a fury, mm -hmm. and by '94 she'd lost most of the use of her legs. Mm -hmm. uh, by '96, '97, I don't I don't have quite the dates and and hours that <laughs> Hall does, but because uh, um, basically we had all four kids, and so we had four kids under five years of age, and so things are pretty much just diapers in a blur you know and so uh <laughs> the uh um so 90s she lost her leg legs middle of the, of uh the 90s and then later 90s she lost the use of both of her arms and by uh 2000 she'd lost 75 percent of her vision and, and was pretty much totally bedridden by the later 90s so you've been dealing with this since intense way for about 20 years mm -hmm. in, in, intensely yeah for yeah. about 20 years yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you know, I, I, I was thinking about how to introduce this, and although I didn't do it this way, and, and when I think of for better and for worse, you, you guys know the story about marital vows and what that actually means. So that when, I, when, when I introduced you as heroes of the faith, I mean, I'm dead serious about this. I think that, that the commitment that you have shown to your spouses has been um, exemplary and really uh, commendable and a wonderful example to the entire community and it's much much appreciated um, what would you what what is I guess the most natural question to ask you is what is it like to go through that entire experience and I'm I'm assuming there really are waves of of positive and negative that you that you negotiate with your faith how do, how do you how do you Go ahead. Take on, take that on. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know. Actually, what happened to Ursula in terms of the really bad stuff happened so fast that I think I was running on adrenaline on an autopilot for at least probably the first month, hmm. which means I don't really have time to kind of self-examine and determine how I feel about this. Obviously, uh, I'm praying that she would survive. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm, you know, I, I'm not really, there came a point, and I remember the point, it was probably about two weeks in when she was still unconscious uh, in the ICU and I was being told we don't know if she's ever going to regain consciousness at this point, uh, that I reconciled myself to the fact that this what was happening was happening and there was not one thing I could do about it hmm. to change it. Um, uh, you know, I mean, obviously I can pray for miracles and we've had several doctors tell us that the fact that she's alive today and functional and, and conscious and everything else with all the problems is a miracle still. Mm -hmm. But I just kind of came to the point where I said, you know, God, I don't know what's going to happen, uh, but I can't do anything one way or the other. I'm just, it was resignation, I guess, hmm. you know, and, you know, that's a point that you come to. There's obviously, you cycle through anger, through terror, mm -hmm. you know, through disappointment, through frustration, through thinking about all the things that might have been that aren't going to be as a result of this. Mm -hmm. um, I ba my career changed. You know, I mean, I'm not producing books and scholarly papers and traveling to conferences and doing outside. I don't have time. Mm -hmm. You know, I teach my classes and I do everything I can. I'm trying to be engaged with as many people on campus as possible, but. 
you know, uh, it, it, my life now revolves around Ursula. Mm -hmm. and, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember as, as a, a young Christian, this has been a long time ago, Okay, uh, I, I won't say how many years, but I had some problems. A lot of, uh, well, you know, it goes with adolescence and everything else, uh, with selfishness, and I prayed that God would make me a less selfish person. I didn't know that, like, 50 years later, that prayer was going to be answered the way it was. Hmm. Uh, but I, I started, <clears throat> among other things, I started to write poetry on my iPhone, you know, because I, I started doing everything on an iPhone because I'm sitting around doctor's offices, waiting rooms, hospital rooms. You know, I have all this time on my hands and suddenly this thing becomes my lifeline to the outside world. Hmm. Uh, but here is here's one that's really short. I'm going to read it because mm -hmm. some of you don't know that I do write poetry. I do have uh, I have a literary background. My undergraduate degree is in English literature. Hmm. OK, just FYI. With a good dose of, <laughs> with a good dose of engineering yeah. thrown in, but I won't go there and explain that when some of you know more about that. I'm just a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's a noble occupation too. But I'll tell you how to plant them straight. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> there you go. Anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna read this really brief thing and then I'll let Greg talk some. I'm gonna experience. Leave me not unchanged, the same as when I once began to love. Unselfish, let me now begin to live what once I thought I knew, but never knew till now, thanks to experience. Mm. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I tell you, Daryl, it's um, in the book of Luke, which you're familiar with. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> In five, Luke 5, and I, I, I remember... I thought you were going to let me guess the verse. I, was say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when you were doing verse by verse, yeah, ex Jesus. Yeah. I think it was in 62, it was to the honors Bacopolis. But um, the, uh, you were going through, and, and, and in that passage, it says there's, there's four men that lowered the paralytic down to Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I know that's not the you know, most important thing in the verse. But, but one of the things that really impressed upon me is that we've always had groups of people around us mm -hmm. uh, that have just absolutely been our lifeline. Mm -hmm. um, and it says, though, and, and they lowered them, they went through the roof, down to Jesus, and, 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 their, and he, when he saw their faith, wasn't the faith of the guy on laying down, mm -hmm. it was their faith. And there's just been many times where our faith has just not even been strong enough to sit up. Hmm. But it's only because of those people around us, our family, the DTS family, our church family, other groups that um, have helped us through. That's why stuff like this, you know, ministering to the marginalized, sometimes we just don't have enough energy to even get up. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there's, there's some days where I just didn't get up. Mm -hmm. And Lisa's laying there because, like I say, she's been bedridden since late 90s. And some days I just, I just lay there with her. Sometimes because of discouragement and you can't and you don't want to get up. Sometimes you're too tired to get up. And uh, but then you get a phone call, or then you get a text, or, or somebody comes alongside you, takes you to lunch. And uh, it's only those types of situations that continue to help you go through. And um, that's just the lifeline. Hmm. Now, we do have mics, so if you want to ask questions, this is our common practice at uh, these chapels, do feel free to step up. I've got one other set of questions I want to rotate through, and that is, um, and you've alluded to this, how can communities help and how do they help people who, who are in the kinds of circumstances that you find yourself in? What, and what advice would you give? To people, you know, obviously many people here are training and will end up in churches and lead ministries. How do you, how do you, how do you develop a good sensitivity for what it takes to minister to, to people in the kind of situation? Here's an example we were talking about a little bit earlier. When our church was built in the sanctuary, and uh, um, I was, it, it meant so much to me when the board came to Lisa and I and said, you know, Lisa's in a wheelchair, you know, we, I get her up, you know, we go to church on Sunday morning and get her in the wheelchair, and, and, and they were building a sanctuary, and they said, we hadn't thought about 
where you guys would sit. Hmm. We have pews, and maybe, maybe we should just move some of the pews or shorten them. Where would you like to sit? Hmm. And that meant so much that they thought enough about the people. Because unfortunately, too many times when uh, people have long-term disabilities or something like that, uh, or some type of infirmities, um, people give them pity versus respect. Hmm. And uh, um, they're made in the image of God, and they need the respect. Yes, they need help, and we all all need the help. But... um, but respecting them as individuals. Um, and, and so it's great. We go to church and there's a spot right there where you know Lisa and I, um, uh, I put Lisa's wheelchair and I'm right next to her. Mm-hmm. And just that the church would have that type of thought for the people who, I love the word, are so many times marginalized. Mm-hmm. Just because you have some type of physical disability doesn't mean you can't contribute. Mm-hmm. And uh, the things that Lisa does, I mean, she prays. I mean, she's there laying on her back all day long listening to Moody Radio. And, and, uh, but then she prays. I'll come home. And, uh, um, and I thank the seminary so much because I take care of Lisa in the morning. She has a feeding. She's had a feeding tube for about eight years, nine years. And so uh, I feed her in the morning. And, then, and, then, and I have, used to have to go home at lunchtime and then, and then the evening. But uh, um, the... Uh, uh, the times when she is there, she prays. And just that type of ministry saying, this is valuable. And for the church to honor those kind of things, I think that's just very meaningful. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> somewhere back uh, several years ago on, uh, I think it's on Doug Chisholm's blog. Some of you know Doug. He's a LPC. He's a counselor. Uh, he posted a really great article called 10 Things Never to Say to Somebody Who's Suffering. And if you want to Google that and find it, they're well worth reading because I don't know how many times people, all well-intentioned, have said things to me or to Ursula like, well, we know that God works all things together for good. Mm-hmm. You know, that, boy, if I could create a textual problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably, me that's not good. <laughs> I'd probably remove that verse from Romans with all due deference to Paul because of it's so dangerous. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I think that, and I think I agree with Greg, I think the friends, family, and people from our church who have stood by us through this, uh, I do not know how many hundreds of meals we received in 2011 and into 2012, uh, sometimes from people we didn't know very well at all, uh, and the people like uh, uh, Deb Chisholm who coordinated the, the meal plan calendar schedule for us. Um, posting on Caring Bridge. Caring Bridge is a great, you know, I actually, that, Greg's wanting to know how I know so much detail. It's not because I remember it, it's because uh, I reviewed the Caring Bridge journal yesterday. I actually printed it out and saved it PDF. It's 168 pages long, hmm. four years hmm. of Caring Bridge posts that hmm. go through everything we went through. Hmm. Someday we really ought to write a book, Ursula and I. Hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, staying in touch with people like that and just, I don't know, getting to the point where people feel comfortable being around people with disabilities. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we've all felt this. If there's somebody in a wheelchair, somebody who has difficulty walking or seeing or talking, there's always this factor of we're torn between pity and revulsion. Mm-hmm. And we don't know how to handle it. It's we extremely don't, awkward. It is extremely awkward. Mm-hmm. And just to be able to treat this person like a human being and extend care and have a pretty much normal conversation is is a really a gift if you can train people to do that so so the key thing is is really um i'm going to say it this way work working hard to to communicate the value of the continued value of the person is really what you're talking about absolutely they're still a human being they're still a human being and in relating to them and and uh not just hearing what's going on with them but bringing them into your life and and making uh, making things uh, 
be as normal as possible yeah. in many ways. Yeah, unfortunately, a lot of times we, we make people feel like the drummer at a Bible church, you know, in that glass cage, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, and every one of them has one. That's it's right, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but they what put, is they, about the drummer? Yeah. I mean, that's like, <laughs> But uh, but all the but uh, people in wheelchairs or they feel like sometimes they feel like that glass cage is around them and nobody mm -hmm. can get near them yeah. and just to even just to even touch them even yep. and even just to to speak with them to kneel down and look at them straight in the eye versus looking down at them mm -hmm. um, that's why I love the statue out here mm -hmm. Jesus kneeling down mm -hmm. and uh, because. Uh, uh, like I know Holly Baker comes in here every once in a while for chapels, and she's the other. She's uh, she also has MS and, and in a wheelchair. And if even if you don't know what to say, that's okay. Just say hi. Mm -hmm. Acknowledgement is just is just so important. Hmm. I'd like Paul. to hear about some of the research that Greg did on his doctor of ministry, where he interviewed married couples and found out some of the keys to successful marriage with disability because you mentioned a lot of spouses divorce or take off so what was your doctoral research that showed that they stayed well it what i did was uh the title's too long to remember but it's it uh it's um basically how do you how, what what are the key characteristics for couples that are going through long-term non-terminal disabilities where basically you have to learn to relate to each other um and like a, a vet who has his legs cut off okay he comes back, um, they were blown off. How does he relate to his wife? He's completely fully functional and relational, but now he has to deal with a disability. You know, and we did some of the key characteristics uh, for that. You know, a lot of them was commitment, uh, communication. When uh, the, in 80, well, it was pretty much in 92 when they confirmed all of the MS when they did. I was sitting in the doctor's office and, and um, um, he says, well, it, it is confirmed it's MS. And, um, Unfortunately, now is the time when usually the husbands leave. Are you like telling me to or what? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and uh, uh, and it's true. About seventy-five uh, mm -hmm. to seventy-five percent of couples who have some type of disability um, divorce or leave, and they usually leave when they're healthy, so they don't feel as guilty because then they just their spouse can go back to their parents, and uh, when they get sick. And so, um, and, it's, and it's the same thing with uh, um, married uh, couples who have dis disabled kids, the same type of thing. But the thing is commitment. When I was in that doctor's office, I remember this man right here's voice came to my mind because Bill married Lisa and I. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was sitting there at that point in time, I had a decision to make whether I would honor the covenant that God, that I made before Lisa and before God and before Bill. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Because Lord knows, got the order right. Yes, because <laughs> Lord knows He would remind me of it. And uh, uh, but uh, uh, but uh, it, it's a choice. Love is a choice, and uh, the commitment and the covenant. You know, uh, you know, it's like we've talked before. A contract is just managed peace. You do this, I do this. You know, as long as we do this with each other, it's okay. It's managed peace. That's not oneness. Covenant is two things coming together of opposite ways. How are we going to work this thing? And uh, and so in the dissertation, a lot of stuff that came out with I, I, I interviewed three couples that had been married over 30 years and had been um, had at least 15 to 20 years of, of disability and uh, communication, uh, commitment. He says, there's a lot of days it just uh, it isn't very fun. And uh, um, and uh, it's just really tough. But you choose. Mm -hmm. You choose. And the odd thing is, is that those principles are the same regardless of right. the condition of your spouse. Exactly right. I mean, nothing changes. Right. Uh, the, the commitments are still there, the engagement, the relationships that we pursue, the communication, the understanding, the caring, the compassion, yeah. all of that is still very much a yeah. part of what needs to be there. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I, well, this is a bit of a selfish question. Um, I am, I recently lost most of my vision and I um, am, I guess, legally blind, but I have basically 100% double vision um, uh, with other health issues along with that. Um, and I'm also single. So my question is, did y'all's wives 
did they have those health issues when you met them? And also, how did you handle that? And what would you say to someone with that situation, with that weirdness and awkwardness and just that whole situation being different among like, I guess, dating other people because that's so different and especially not being able to see um, and walk and stuff like that. So. Go ahead. Oh, that's probably your I, I guess it is. Yeah. Um, you know, it's really interesting. Um, <clears throat> my wife uh, was, I think, sort of prepared by her mother uh, to think, you know, there were things she would never do. She would never drive a car uh, in Germany. Uh, they test for visual field. She drove a car here for 20 years, actually, with self-imposed restrictions of local only, no freeways, no night driving, and under 45 miles an hour. But she could have done all that with the way it's licensed here. Anyway, my, my mother-in-law also pretty much told her, you know, you can forget about ever getting married because no man is going to want to marry you. Um, and I was in Sheffield and doing my residency for my PhD at the university. The church I was attending took an exchange program with 12 families plus me, the representative single, to go to Germany for a week in May of 1983 on an exchange program and live in the homes of German families in the sister church in Germany. And Ursula and I actually saw each other for the first time. The, we got there Saturday night, Sunday morning. We're going to do a church service. Um, I'm an ordained minister. i am actually been teaching here at seminary for four years with a master's degree because those were simpler days and you could do that. <laughs> now, well, it's true. This was the early 80s. Yeah. OK, so I have to have a part in that service. It's just like protocol, etiquette and protocol. So the Methodist minister from England is going to preach the sermon with the translator. The German minister is going to do the rest of the service. And I'm going to bring you know, five minutes of greetings from the brethren in America. OK, great. So I had a friend help me write it out whose mother was German. It was at the university. And I had a speech all prepared. And you know, five minutes before the service, we're trying to sort out who's going to stand up and say what when, because I could read some theological German. I couldn't speak a word of it. I never studied it. I minored in French. Didn't help me there. Um, uh, That's an important piece of information. Yeah, it is. And so the German minister's wife went out in the in the congregation and asked this young woman who was working in Stuttgart now at a regional bank, had lived in England for a year, was fluent in English, if she would step into the pastor study and sort us all out. And that's how we met. We uh, we sat on the front row together, and I remember looking very hard at her left hand to see if she had a ring on. <laughs> Little did I know that in Germany and much of Europe, the ring goes on the left hand when you're engaged and it switches to the right hand when you get married. <laughs> I was just lucky. <laughs> so by Thursday, we were discussing getting married. We Which language? <laughs> Well, English, Greg, because I, my German improved later. Um, we corresponded for seven weeks every day, and at the end of that time, she took her summer holidays on the island of Guernsey in the English Channel with a family that had three daughters, and she had been 10 years. Every summer, she'd gone and spent six weeks with them. Yeah, this is Europe. You get six weeks vacation, OK? Mm -hmm. Um, and she invited me to come down for part of that time without even checking with the family because she knew it would be okay with them. So I flew down first week of August of 83, and a week later we got engaged in the town of St. Peterport on Guernsey. Hmm. And we were then married in her hometown in the Black Forest December 30th hmm. of 1983. Hmm. Now, let me just add one other thing, though. At this point, she has already got the RP. She had, does not have night vision at all in a very restricted visual field. I think at the time it was about 10 degrees. Yeah, I remember Normal is 170. Story, when, when so she could see ahead at seven or eight feet away is all she could see of a person. 
But she was walking home from work in Stuttgart. She'd get off the subway and walk up the hill several blocks to her apartment in the dark. And she could hear when she went past a side street or an alley or whatever, she could hear there was nothing there because her hearing was so that much sharper. Like it blew me away that yeah. she had the courage to do this by herself at night. Mm -hmm. Now this was a simpler age and it was also a European city, mm -hmm. which is, means it's safer than many US cities. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, all that being said, I was just totally blown away by the courage that this person had to try to live a normal life and conduct herself as a human being. It, it just, you know, I, there's never been any so, issue so, on that. So I think the response to the question goes something yeah. like... Uh, Sorry, I forgot yeah. the question. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of got carried away. Yeah, uh, but the response to the question goes that, that, that there may be someone at, special out there that, uh, yes. that for whom all, those will not be obstacles. Those are not. Yeah, right. that's right. right. And it may take a special person. But, yeah, yeah don't give up hope. Yeah. Yeah. What was no? I was over was, thirty. We were both over thirty, by the way, when we met and got married. What was your name? Uh, Lauren. 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 Oh, Lauren. Well, sorry about your situation, Lauren. Mm -hmm. Really, but see, the thing is, your spirit. That's one of the things. You know, the kids asked me one time. Says, "What drew you to mom?" And obviously, she wasn't. She didn't have uh, the uh, MS at that time. And I said, "Her eyes and her smile." My two sons said, yeah, right. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but, uh, but really, the, yeah, the thing... Yeah, get it. No, no. But, <laughs> but really, like Lauren, the thing is, um, your, the, uh, your spirit, for, and this is just for all of us, um, because Lisa asks me today, or I remember a few years back, um, she says, I'm just sorry I'm not the wife you married. Hmm. And I said, you are. Your spirit and your smile or what I married. She says, well, I'm, I can't do what I used to do. I said, I can't do what I used to do. <laughs> you know? and, uh, um, and the thing is that some of us have external infirmities and some of us have internal infirmities and all of us need to be able to work through those in our relationships and have grace as, as we relate to each other. Hmm. Well, our time amazingly is gone. Um, let's express our appreciation. These oh. two <laughs>